Welcome to our talk. I'm Daniel. This is Felix. Uh, we are workmates from Deutsche Bahn. Uh, this is Germany's largest railway operator. And in particular, we are working at DB Systel. Um, and uh, this is the bunch of computer scientists, software engineers, and data scientists at Deutsche Bahn. And uh, yeah, we are working to improve the quality of Deutsche Bahn services. So our customers are, for example, um, those that run these uh, fancy high-speed trains, um, but also station operators, which uh, uh, operate uh, like escalators. Uh, we also have uh, energy generating facilities. And all these, um, all this equipment tends to fail at some point. That's clear. Also, at some point, it gets repaired. That's also clear. But we try to um, improve the MTTR, so the mean time to repair, by providing software assistance to um, service personnel. Um, so for like two years ago, we are working now on a universal platform in order to provide condition, main, uh, condition monitoring as a, a prerequisite for um, predictive maintenance. And we want to build it uh, in a universal way. And therefore, we are listening into machinery. And uh, we stick sensors, like these microphones, into machines in order to um, detect their state and uh, yeah, alarm personal in case something seems to break. Um, the challenges here, probably most of you know them, uh, as it is often, often the case in, in data science, is uh, that we want to have generalizing models. Um, also, we are not in a research facility, but in industry. Therefore, our customers expect um, yeah, uh, improvements uh, pretty early on. Uh, even in situations with little data and uh, maybe poorly annotated data. We've been choosing a machine learning approach actually to, to address that. And um, yeah, we uh, tackle these challenges using um, a transfer learning approach. So in a nutshell again, condition monitoring goals we want to decrease the maintenance costs, optimize the personal placement, since uh, service personnel cannot be everywhere all the time. And we want to increase the availability, since uh, some of our customers um, uh, uh, have to provide such an uh, availability of uh, machinery in order to uh, allow uh, yeah, operations. Um, transfer learning goals, uh, in our sense, uh, are to increase the prediction accuracy and uh, also to uh, go uh, uh, to allow a quick start with the customer. Let's have a look at uh, the system architecture that uh, we have uh, established over time uh, here for the service delivery. So as I pointed out, we put plenty of these microphones into the field. Um, and uh, so we have sensor boxes developed using um, Raspberry Pis in a, let's say, robust, robust variant using embedded microtechnology uh, integrator boards. We are using uh, the Eclipse Foundation software stack, which is also used in uh, IoT scenarios, Cura, for example. And we use these to sample, actually, the audio emissions from the machinery and uh, compress it, transfer it back to the cloud backend. Uh, where we are using plenty of Linux, using Amazon Web Services in that case. And uh, yeah, we are managing our fleet using command build and chef and uh, yeah, look into the data using Grafana, the, the tick stack, and also the ELK stack. And we make extensive use of the Python language, um, Java, Ruby, and uh, also MQTT messaging. On the data analysis uh, pipeline part, actually we um, uh, do predictions um, in the field, also uh, uh, in, in the Cura framework. Um, we train our models actually in the back end on the cloud side uh, using TensorFlow and Keras. 
And uh, yeah, we also use a couple of more technologies which might be pretty familiar to you. Let's go into particular matters now. Um, so for two years now we are recording data uh, from escalators and uh, Deutsche Bahn operates about a thousand of them in Germany and um, yeah, uh, failures in uh, uh, such escalators tend to become very costly pretty soon if you do not stop the machinery in time since uh, yeah, they, they wear off very quickly. And um, also it is uh, important for uh, maintenance personnel to um, schedule uh, maintenance on these escalators in the night shift in order not uh, to conflict with um, the accessibility uh, contractual uh, liabilities here. And um, yeah, I can show you a couple of issues with these escalators. So mostly it is about foreign bodies which get uh, somehow into the uh, machines like coins, glass, crush travel and stuff like that, screws that fell off uh, luggages and um, yeah, then uh, they uh, somehow wear off the machine and um, we want to detect that early on. Here I brought uh, some sound examples from an escalator in Hamburg. Um, the top uh, plot is the waveform and we transform actually the waveform into spectrograms. So uh, we consider also the, the frequency and the time space in order to detect uh, the, the machine's health state, so to say. So this is a good case here. Maybe you uh, focus on the lower part on the spectrogram. Now I'm switching to um, a squeaky uh, to, to a squeaky recording. So here the steps are not properly adjusted and uh, yeah, they, they, they make a very intensive noise and uh, also the, the ball bearings are actually suffering and tend to fail after some time if no um, maintenance personnel is uh, about to fix that. So you can see here that there's plenty of power, <coughs> plenty of power uh, in these um, recordings in, uh, on different frequencies. You can see that it has a certain periodicity since uh, the machine is running at constant speed and uh, the, the steps are passing by the microphone uh, at a constant rate. And um, yeah, basically as we've seen in the previous talk, uh, uh, we have seen that convolutional neural networks are very good to detect uh, patterns in pictures and we are using such spectrograms actually as, as input data to our detection schemes and uh, Felix is about to present these uh, detection schemes to you. Yeah, thanks Daniel and hi also from my side. Um, so um, I want to give you an overview of what we've been doing in the past. So um, as he already mentioned, we use convolutional neural networks and use the spectrograms as input images and um, we then find out what kind of state the machine is in at any given moment in time. And um, we have, of course, the problem that um, if you know what the sound is right now, it might not be that it's the sound the machine is doing all the time. So after this, we need to do some kind of post-processing to get out some kind of oscillation in our predictions. So um, as Daniel mentioned, if we have a new use case, we might have really little data, so how could we use transfer learning to do something about that and uh, reduce the time and cost for data um, labeling and you know, acquisition of um, new audio. And uh, this is the approach we've been using before. So um, we had this um, escalator sound data set where we could um, go to an escalator and basically put it in any state we want, so we threw in gravel or we um, hit every part in the machine with hammers and stuff. So we have this data set. Then we train our models and um, we get a condition monitoring classifier. And um, a problem we have there is also, let's say we find out, okay, there's a new failure state and we don't have the data for it yet. Maybe we only have a few samples and um, that's also a use case we want to use transfer learning for. 
And um, here I give you an overview of how we are using transfer learning. So actually, if you look in the um, scenario of um, transfer learning in vision, it's uh, quite often that there are huge pre-trained networks available which have been trained on many millions um, of images. It's not the same case in audio. There's one huge data set, it's called AudioSet. I think it has 22 million um, snippets from YouTube. But um, the research is just um, getting started there, basically. There are a few good um, uh, results already. But we decided to transfer knowledge from the computer vision models and use that um, um, because if you know in these early layers, the models tend to learn, let's say, edges, borders. And um, if we cut off our uh, model, um, as is kind of depicted here, and uh, see the activations, we use what um, has been already done um, in the vision department. And um, what we decided is to not uh, refit some new neural networks layers, but instead use uh, traditional, more traditional approaches like support vector machines, random forest classifiers, um, to fit new models on those activations. Um, back to the escalator case. Um, so how, is, how does our experiment look like? Um, we took a huge model pre-trained on ImageNet and um, applied basically the same approach I showed you right now. Um, we wanted to compare different architectures, so we took uh, Inception V3 model, VGG16, a couple of others, and then we um, fed our um, data set in and uh, remembered the activations to train some random forests. And um, to make a comparison, we also took our approach we had before to train the neural networks from scratch, and um, let's see how that went. <clears throat> So in this case, uh, we can see that um, on the x-axis, you have the available audio training data in minutes. So we always increase the training data, then fit new models from the different approaches, and checked uh, what kind of accuracy on our test set we could achieve. And um, of course, 18 minutes of audio is like really little, and uh, we wouldn't probably give the recommendation, let's say, to our product owner to deploy such a model. But we can definitely see that there's a certain range in which um, these um, in blue and orange, um, the transfer learning approaches, can reach a higher accuracy than would be possible when training a network from scratch. Uh, from scratch. Um, about this slide, we need to see it um, not so much quantitatively, maybe a little bit more qua uh, qualitative, because to get these insights, we trained a huge number of models and it took a really long time, so we couldn't do hyperparameter tuning for all the models. So um, if in doubt, it could always be the case that um, maybe uh, optimized model, let's say from the uh, training from scratch approach, could be uh, getting a bigger accuracy. But what we say is, if we are in this box with the dotted lines, um, we can definitely say, at least looking into the transfer learning approach is probably a good idea. And if we have less audio than, um, let's say, to the left side of the red line, um, it would be advisable to uh, consider deploying this approach. <clears throat> so what do we conclude from that? Um, from a customer perspective, if we have little data, maybe only half an hour it could already be enough to at least give a reasonably good model to the customer and satisfy this um, need to get a result really quickly. And, um, from a business perspective, we don't need expert time so much to get a, uh, give us the labeled data. We can already, with a little bit of help from the service technicians, get um, quite okay models. And um, technically, definitely in small data sets, we can get improved accuracy as compared to before. And um, what's also good about this approach if we only take the activations and train a different model, we can choose a model which doesn't tend to overfit that much. And um, limitations, um, this is like one use case and it worked really well. If we would have a different use case and um, maybe a different type of audio noises from the machines, it might be not so suitable there. But it's definitely a good thing to have in our toolbox and the next time 
um, we have a new use case, we can think about de um, deploying such a model. So where does that leave us? Next steps, um, we would like to deploy this and um, see how it compares to the models we have so far and get more insights how this approach can help us and maybe improve on it. Um, another thing that would be really nice, as I mentioned, we used models which were trained on image data and we would like to ut utilize a huge data set um, that's built totally on machine sounds to do transfer learning um, in the future. And um, that's a topic we want to research and we're working on building up this data, but uh, at the moment, unfortunately, we're not there yet. But it's definitely on our agenda for 2019 and beyond. Um, and uh, we would also like to see um, how suitable is this uh, approach for deployment on our edge devices, and um, that's something we're, I would say, maybe close to testing out, and yeah, exactly. So. Um, that's it from our side. Um, thanks for the attention and yeah, feel free to ask questions. So uh, to repeat the question, why did we use convolutional neural networks? Um, he mentioned audio data is sequential, why not use recurrent neural networks? Um, so there has been work on that in uh, acoustic scene classification and audio event detection. And um, what they found out is that um, it's, you need less data usually to get quite good results if you use uh, CNNs on time frequency representations such as the spectrograms we use. Um, there have been end-to-end -end approaches, but um, I think you need more data and um, it's like a common approach to choose um, in that uh, setting. Yeah, to um, repeat the question, if we have tried something with Kalman filters, Kalman filters, or if we have applied um, general um, GANs to um, yeah, augment our data maybe. Um, so um, we're talking about GANs and it's something we would like to try out. And um, in audio classification, it's something that's been gaining popularity. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but um, Kalman filters, um, I haven't um, thought about in the context yet. We are looking for internships in Frankfurt, so if you're interested in GANs, <laughs> just drop us a note. To repeat the question, he's asking uh, if we are thinking about open sourcing our data set. Ah, yes, okay. So uh, we are making extensive use of uh, open source software, as you have seen in the talk. Uh, currently, our organization is paving the way, actually, to contrib contribute back, because there are many hurdles, uh, organizational and uh, jurisdictional, and um, we are looking forward to that maybe next year. Yeah. Okay, to repeat the question, um, how much time does it take to predict our model? 
Um, so uh, we have deployed this kind of model on uh, Raspberry Pis, and it can run in near real time, um, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. okay, okay. First business wise, I guess you have like a maximum time to predict, otherwise it's not useful. And then I guess of course your model is able to predict the minimum time so in this this range. Um yeah, so there's like a short term component. So um we have small recordings for of several seconds, let's say ten seconds and um but then we consider it a hyperparameter also how to cut the spectrograms and uh, cut them into patches and then you can average over those and um, depending on what kind of scenario you have then you will have um, more or less noisy predictions and um, then you can aggregate over that and apply some kind of statistics um, maybe windowing um, what's coming in and um, yeah so um, of course, it depends on what kind of machine you try to um, predict the condition. Um, for some, it might be important to act really quickly. For others, um, you might have something that's um, more long time where you can say, okay, let's see the average predictions in the last couple of hours or something. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay. Um, so the question was whether we um, fine-tune those models um, when doing transfer learning or whether we just take them as is and just see what the activations are. And um, in the experiment we showed in this talk, um, it was just taking activations as is. We have tried um, also um, some experiments where we do fine-tuning, um, but especially with that little data, we didn't have the same uh, results and especially the kind of simplicity of doing it this way and getting a good result um, was something why we wanted to pursue that further but maybe that's something for the future um, to take up again. Yes. So um, we we are aiming at a uh, ah yes okay. So um, why uh, the the question was why we are using uh, actually acoustic data and uh, if if it can be put on rolling stock right was it right yeah okay. So we are aiming at a universal platform which can be fit into various uh, machineries and also there there's plenty of regulations uh, in terms of modifying machinery. So this is non-intrusive. We just uh, pick up the acoustic emissions. We do, do not have to change machinery itself, okay? Um, so th this is the one part. We are also looking into rolling stock. Next week we are installing in trains in, uh, I think, in Cottbus and uh, try to understand um, when uh, steps which uh, come out automatic, automatically from the train, uh, when, when these tend to fail because this is a, a big pain for, for this uh, uh, train operator actually. So rolling stock, yes, um, acoustic emissions uh, in terms of uh, minimum or non-intrusiveness. Uh, 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 um, also, um, we, we haven't mentioned this today, uh, we are looking also in uh, acceleration data. And uh, so this is minimal intrusive since we can just uh, clue the uh, sensors on top of the machinery and this is yeah, borderline in, in that sense, yeah, okay. So to repeat the question, uh, if I understood correctly, um, is it uh, how often do we make a retraining on the models um, when basically in production? Um, so um, it depends if you have like a data flow coming back in a use case, 
let's say, experts that um, can provide more labeled data, then uh, there will be some retraining probably uh, if it imp helps improve the model. Um, we are currently working on some kind of um, continuous <coughs> learning platform. Um, we haven't uh, fully implemented anything yet, but um, it's definitely something we want to take up in the future. Also, in that case, we had the possibility to actually inject hardware faults into the escalator. So we are training a, a, a classification scheme. On the other hand, like for the power generation utilities, we won't be able to actually in, inject faults. Therefore, we are going to a trend detection scheme. We are currently working on autoencoders and spectral analysis to do that. And here we have to train uh, way more often to... to um, uh, find out these uh, trend uh, developments. Yeah. So it uh, actually depends if we are going supervised or unsupervised. Yeah.